Professor Yamai got his PhD from the University of California, Davis, and, but um, he's been in the U.S. for, how, how long have you been in the U.S.? Almost 18 years. Um, and so, uh, 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 and, and his research, in a way, spans um, both the theoretical questions that are globally timely, but also matter for Japan. Um, as I was reading over his CV again uh, last night, what I was really struck by is um, the breadth of research material. I think, you know, it's, it's fair to say that Professor Yamai's research focuses on really credit markets and banking, um, both how, how, what kind of effects do different regulations have, and what are the political determinants by which these regulations are created or how, how politicians or political actors manage banking systems overall. And so, so in this time where we're, you know, in this global financial crisis, as we're reevaluating, you know, what are the rules that will best regulate banks? How can we avoid another crisis? Um, and can political actors be, be trusted in a way to, to set up the rules that will maximize our, our collective welfare, I think are very difficult questions, but which Professor Amai looks at both, both uh, in a contemporary world, but also historically, looking at credit markets in London, in Japan, in the pre-war period. Um, and I also found even a research project on Thailand, which I hadn't been aware about. Um, and so today, uh, he'll talk about his research on Japan. Um, so please join me in uh, welcoming Professor Mai. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, <laughs> sort of every time somebody introduced me to... Um, Audience like that gets really embarrassing, but uh, thank you for <laughs> kind word. But uh, so this talk is uh, actually joined with uh, one of the Wesleyan students who was an undergraduate student. Uh, he was really smart. I encouraged him to go to uh, graduate school in the United States, but he decided to work for Mitsubishi Corporation, and he's a semi-professional soccer player, so he's not... Uh, after he graduated, he didn't help me with the research, but uh, that's okay. Um, all right. So, uh, that, as the title suggests, it's, it's about integration of banking system or, or global, globalization of banks uh, across uh, national, national borders. And I'm going to use Japan's sort of like a natural experiment to, to get at one of the important questions. Okay. Uh, since I have, uh, I guess, 45 minutes, I'm going to, and since most of you guys are not economists, so I'm going to kind of talk about the big picture first and get to my research question. So um, globalization banking system. So the, a lot of interesting issues, which I'm going to talk about briefly, but uh, so people in the World Bank and IMF have looked at this over and over again. So. Uh, if you look at the data, the, you know, the globalization of banking is, is there, right? So uh, the, these banks from the United States and Spain and Germany and Italy, they would expand their branches and subsidiaries to the emerging market, mostly Eastern European countries and Latin America. And it usually takes place in the context of some kind of bank privatization and acquisition of local banks in the in the aftermath aftermath of banking crisis. So, a lot of these banks in Latin America they have really bad asset portfolios, and they needed to to liquidate, and they have a hard time finding a, a buyers for for the insolvent banks with uh, a lot of non-performing loans, and foreigners basically step in to to purchase those banks. Okay. And, and the third important factor that's going to be a little bit more important in the future, especially with China and India, is that the World Trade Organization plays, is going to play an important role in facilitating the globalization. But uh, just a little bit of background. If you look at uh, the number of acquisitions of banks in developing countries, you know, there's a lot. Uh, it's led by United States and Spain. And... Of course, other countries participate in that, and Japan is, of course, one of them, which expanded into a lot of these other Asian countries. Uh, and this evolution started in 1990s, when, <laughs> yeah, when there were a lot of financial crisis, and, and former communist countries wanted to privatize their banking system. Okay. 
Uh, so a couple of big pictures that, big, big things that the people at the World Bank or IMF have been interested in. So, you know, usually cost, when they think about globalization, we think about, you know, what's the effect of the, the foreign entry on local economy, and a couple of good things happen. So one would be the technological transfer. So multinational corporations, including multinational banks, may have better technology, and that technology can be transferred to, to, to local entities through uh, FDI. Or, uh, so it's kind of related to technological transfer, so these entities are more productive, so that could potentially wa raise wages for local workers, and uh, that could be a good thing. Okay. Banking people have investigated some other aspect of globalization, though. So one of them would be uh, maybe a reduced politicization of capital allocation. So they just are developing economies have spent so much time looking into the loan books of local banks in developing countries. Turns out that a lot of loans are made based on political considerations. And if you look through the evolution of those banks, after the transition into uh, uh, global, you know, globalized entity, the politicization of uh, loan making is there's some evidence that, that that's been reduced, yeah. and the competitiveness uh, seems to be enhanced by the entry of foreign banks. Uh, the third one is a little bit more controversial. So again, the, if you look at the the, the assets of uh, uh, small lo uh, local banks in developing countries is dominated by the debts that's issued by, by the government. So what's going on is that uh, these governments are running huge budget deficit and somehow through political exchange they're able to place those debts on the asset side of these, these banks. Foreign banks do, are not tied to those politicians or government so they could refuse that. So it could potentially discipline governments uh, who are running huge budget deficit, uh, irresponsible fiscal policy. Okay. Uh, the one negative side that the people have found was that the foreign banks might lend exclusively to just good borrowers and neglect small businesses. And, and all of these arguments or assumptions or assertions uh, have found some empirical support, uh, but that's not about what I'm talking about those. What I'm talking about today is uh, what we call bank lending channel. It's a channel in which banking system can potentially propagate business cycle. Okay. And a lot of macroeconomists uh, took a look at it since the uh, Great Depression. So how does it work? Well, if you look at the bank's balance sheet, it's dominated, the liability side is dominated by, by deposits. That's the ultimate short-term loans to the bank. And a small proportion of that liability is, is fin financed by equity capital. So banks are high, what we call a highly leveraged financial institutions, and that makes them really fragile. Why? When the, the, when the value of assets go down, just like what, ha what happened two years ago, the banks are gonna be close to insolvent. An insolvent institution will have a hard time attracting short-term funds. The only way to recover from that is to deleverage, meaning that liquidating the, the, these assets, including loans. So that could be really bad for the economy. Okay. So what we, what the government decided to do that, to 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 mitigate that cycle or vicious cycle is to enforce some kind of capital regulation. So the the, the government can force banks to hold a lot more a lot more equity capital than they're willing to hold, and so to to basically reduce the leverage. And so far, it hasn't worked really well, though. So that's the kind of sad part of it. Uh, you know, Basel One, which was in 1988, they thought it was going to work, but you know, Japanese financial crisis hit. Basel Two, uh, that was like five years ago, and this crisis hit, this is going to be the next one, and uh, can many fin most financial economists will tell you that uh, we're going to have financial crisis in the next, fi another financial crisis in the next 50 years, okay? Uh, here we go. Okay, so, so this is sort of a simplistic view of bank lending channel. What I'm 
talking about is that, that that channel is a little bit more complicating cated by uh, globalization of financial system because all these banks are holding assets in different parts of the world and then the shock originate, originating from, from different parts of the world can have different implications. Okay. So the ultimately policy makers may be interested in this kind of question. So we have globalized financial system. How does that affect local business cycle? How does that affect a small country like uh, Brunei or Thailand or Brazil. Okay. What does it mean to have such a huge presence of foreign foreign bank? Does is it going to mitigate, reduce the volatility of output cycle and credit cycle, or is it going to to make it more volatile? Okay. And the different views. So the positive view is uh, mostly informed by the by the experience of Great Depression. So, but anyway, so uh, the. How does that work? Uh, a large bank's balance sheet does not depend on idiosyncratic local conditions or local shock as, as much as local unit banks. So what does that mean? Well, if I have a small presence in, let's say, in Thailand, and Thai economy gets hit by some kind of asset, uh, uh, asset bubble, right? That's not going to affect my own balance sheet as much, so I'm going to be able to supply more, uh, you know, even with a negative shock, I'm going to be able to continue to supply credit to the economy. Okay. Negative view is, is informed by, again, the crisis in the 1980s and 90s, so a large bank has access to a large pool of borrowers in different parts of the world, so when, when, when one of these economies goes down with a negative economic shock, they can quickly pull out from that market, and that could amplify credit cycle. Okay. Uh, I've looked through different literatures, and it seems to me that uh, you know the, the positive view uh, is really popular. So the first one, which is really famous, is that the you know, experience of Great Depression. So Great Depression is a worldwide phenomenon which affected almost all countries. Okay. But the banking experience really dif uh, differs significantly across countries. So you got the United States, whose you know ha half of its banking system was basically done during the Great Depression. Whereas in Canada, the output collapse in Canada was was really bad because U.S. the neighbor was experiencing serious a serious output collapse. But their bank banking system was quite robust, and the economic historian would attribute that to the fact that. Uh, Canadian banking system was a lot more diversified and were able to observe idiosyncratic shock that's hitting one part of the Canadian economy. Okay. Another piece of evidence comes from the fact that uh, the U.S. economic volatility seems to be lessened by branching the regulations which took place in the 80s. Okay. And and of course, that results could potentially change after after you know what we observed over the last two years. But uh, there you go. But uh, the, so what I'm arguing in this paper is this third effect. So there are a lot of ifs. Though. So if a large international globalized bank hold a concentrate, uh, take a concentrate risk in one market, that could be really really destabilizing. To, to the other economy, because okay. it's a concentrated risk and small shock in the market could really reduce the value of the of the large conglomerate, okay. and they're gonna have to pull back their loan operation in different different parts of the world, okay. and uh, the ongoing financial crisis seems to exhibit a pattern consistent with that. So the loans provided by these uh, globalized banks seem to have declined in emerging markets. Okay, and then the just different case studies. Uh, the first one here is really interesting. So these banks took again concentrated risk during the first Iraqi war. They invested a lot of money in Iraq in 1991. They lost a lot of money, and as a result, they had to cut back on their loan supply from you know, local economy in Texas, something like that. And this economy really went through a severe recession because of the fact that uh, these guys took reckless, le reckless risk. Okay? And also Japanese banks, which went through uh, its, uh, their own financial trouble in the 1990s, mm -hmm. 
they 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 pull funds away from uh, U.S. operations and some other Asian countries. Okay, so there's some anecdotal evidence that suggests that this could be a serious problem if uh, large banking corporations uh, manage risk improperly. Okay, all right. So our paper is sort of extension of that testing of this argument based upon uh, Japanese data. Okay. And we're going to look at, we're going to basically we collected the data on, on, on the branch network of large city banks across different parts of Japan. And we traced the, the, the effect of a financial shock uh, in different parts of Japan. And most of the financial shocks that hit Japan at the time was, was in the cities. Okay. And our data hopefully will capture that. Um, <coughs> Another thing which is a little bit more technical, though, is that uh, economists are sort of obsessed with estimating the effect of financial shock. And that's really difficult because financial shock and economic shock take place at the same time. Okay. This is an example in which I might be able to say something about the, exogenous, the effect of exogenous change in, in loan supply on real economic performance, partly because the shocks originated in, in the cities not in the rural rural areas. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, okay. And why do I focus on Japan? Well, the, the, the simplistic reason is that I'm Japanese and my course <laughs> is Japanese. So we know the data, we know the institution. So we have you know, definite comparative advantage in that relative to those guys at the World Bank who have, who have comparative advantage in assembling international data. Uh, but that's not only it, though. So, um, the, well, well, let's start with the limitation, right? So I'm going to look at the allocation of funds across different parts of Japan, within Japan. So that may not say as much about what's going to happen to Argentina or Brazil when American banks get hit by a financial shock. It's the, the institutions are different, so that's not that's going to affect the point the estimate. Okay. The, la, 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 la. However, though, the within country study could be good because precisely because we don't have the institutional differences, right? So some you know Argentina might go through severe credit cycle party because in the institution might be screwed up. So we're going to be able to hold those things constant if you just focus on, 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 on the on focus on the variation within Japan. Okay. Another fact, which is which I think is really important, is that uh, it's really really difficult to collect uh, consistent data across different countries. So uh, let's see. Yeah, banking structure. How do you measure banking structure in, in different countries and make it comparable? Uh, uh, financial economists have have been obsessed over that, and it's really difficult. Okay, the size of financial intermediation that's again really hard because most of it, most some of these banks in different countries are owned by by the government, and a loan one unit of loan a dollar worth of loan provided by state-owned government could be a lot different from a dollar worth of loan provided by private banks. So it's, it's, it's really difficult. Okay. And uh, we might be able to overcome that, that difficulty by focusing on Japan. Yeah. Economists usually show the results first, and this is uh, the way we do it, so I just do it. But uh, uh, this is the way that my advisor told me to do, so it's kind of sticking with me. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, so credit condition of financial integrated prefectures tend to be a lot more sensitive to land price fluctuations in the cities than financially isolated ones. Okay. So the way that, that, I, that, that I want you guys to picture it is that the, when asset price collapsed in the cities in the early 1990s, what kind of prefectures uh, experienced uh, collapse in lending? Well, those are the ones that, that are financially integrated. Okay. And then the effect of the shrinkage in loan supply is sort of big, you know, 20 to 40 percent elasticity. Okay. If, you, if you do a simulation, that, that accounts for, you know, 50 percent 50 percent of the declining output in, in some parts of Japan. So that's pretty big. Okay. 
Uh, the data, the panel data that goes from 1980 to 2003 and uh, 47 prefectures. And I'm going to use the, the value of land as a measure of financial shock. And of course, there are a lot of things going on at the time, though, but uh, this seems to be the dominant force that affected uh, the financial viability of banks at the time. Uh, and partly that's because the, the, the Japanese banks tended to use land as a collateral in a blind fashion. So when, when, the, when the value of land went down, the, the asset value went down with it. Uh, and also, you know, so many people, including myself, have looked at the <laughs> bank level data and they tend to suggest that uh, there's a strong causal link from land price to credit supply. Okay. So I'm going to believe that the result of the bank level data and try to apply it to the prefecture level data. Okay. Uh, and the city branch network as a measure of banking integration. Here we go. Just a little bit of picture. Uh, so I show this picture to uh, other financial economists who study uh, U.S. economy. The situation is really similar. So we talk about uh, the financial shocks or asset price bubble, and you know it, it is really a localized event. So in the case of the United States, if you see the similar similar map, it's concentrated in places like Nevada. Okay, and some other places are not uh, are not as affected by by the by the bubble, and the same thing is going on in Japan. So that's it. Econometrically, though, this could present a little bit of problem. So you got uh, that this is a measure of banking integration, and that picture is really similar to to that one. So I'm not, it, when I saw this these two pictures, I thought I was going to abandon this project just because I. It, it's really difficult to isolate the effects. So, but it turned out to be they are they were rich enough to 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 figure out what's going on. All right. So, this is sort of crazy part, and I apologize in advance. But uh, I hopefully I can give you some intuition behind it. So, I'm going to relate uh, the loan growth in each prefecture to a different variable. So, the first one, uh, you know, those alpha you can ignore that for now. So alpha I and alpha T for now. But it's going to depend on, on the change in, in the price of uh, local land. And that matters because that could indicate the profitability of businesses in that particular prefecture. Or that could indicate the health of local banks who do business in that prefecture. So alpha 1 should be positive. Okay. The key parameter is alpha 2, so that captures the interaction of change in, in the city land price to the measure of bank integration. So I would say, or this is what's going to turn out, I would say alpha 2 is, is positive. What does that mean? It means that a unit of shock to the price of land in the cities that's going to translate into a larger reduction, oh, sorry, uh, if it's negative shock, so larger reduction in loan supply if the prefecture has a larger presence of city banks. Okay. So alpha 2 should be, should be positive. Okay. Um, and I dropped six prefectures that contain the, 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 the six major cities, and I also dropped Hokkaido because that was a little bit crazy city in that it has a city bank called uh, Hokkaido Takshok Bank, which failed in 1997. So I wanted to make an apple to apple comparison by dropping that. Okay. Um, that's it. The second thing that I wanted to do is that, uh, you know, Credit growth is an important variable, but at the end of the day, you know, we care about economic performance, GDP. So somehow, I'm going to, I'm, I want to say something about the financial financial cycle in relation to economic cycle. So one way to do that is to estimate what economists call reduced form equation by replacing uh, change in loan with change in GDP. Okay, so that's going to be able to, uh, that's going to allow me to to capture the effect of city land price shock on local economy, a local economic performance. Okay. The second one is uh, this crazy thing called instrumental variable specification. So what it does is this. Okay. 
so when yeah so when when the volume law is declining in a particular prefecture that could mean two things right it could mean that the supply of bank loan is declining due to some kind of credit crunch which we've been trying to capture or just the demand is declining okay and these two effects are really really hard to separate in this particular case, though, a lot of shock to loan supply originated from the fact that, uh, that these city banks were exposed to shocks in the cities, which is outside of the local economy. So we can potentially treat that as exogenous shock to the system. And we're going to use that uh, you know, plausible exogenous variation in loan supply to estimate uh, real effects of loan supply, basically. So uh, this is the results, and I'm gonna um, go through one of, uh, one by one. Um, the yeah, this is what I was talking about. So uh, the local land price, you know, is highly significant. So those prefectures that experienced the severest recession are the ones that experienced uh, a collapse in land price, and well, that's you know not, not surprising. This is what's going on in the United States. If you look at Nevada, that's the economy that's going through a really bad recession. Okay? The one that I'm really interested in is, is this, though. So the interaction of Citibank share to the city land price shock, and that's positive. So that means this banking integration sort of magnifies the transmission of shock originating in, originated in city to a local economy. And based on that, you know, this is the elasticity, which is 37 to 40 percent. That's 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 pretty big. Okay. Uh, the, but this is a little bit t too simplistic, though. So I'm going to have this result go through a series of tests to convince myself <laughs> and then referees that uh, this is exactly what's going on. <laughs> um, the first thing is that. Uh, so in the United States, we have what we call the, uh, ooh, I forgot the name of that index. Case, yeah, Case Shooter Index, which keep track of the transaction price of, of real estate in the, uh, housing in the United States. In Japan, we don't have that. So these land prices are based upon appraisal. Okay. And that's a little tricky because appraisals could be wrong, could be really, really wrong because it's based upon the past transaction. So it lags behind the new information. It's based upon the transaction that occurred in the neighborhood. So that's, again, it's going to contaminate uh, the regression a little bit. Of course, there's no, you know, we don't have case shiller index, so the way we deal with it is to basically assume that, yeah, these appraisers may be screwed up in the short run. But over time, they're going to be able to adjust their appraisal te technical methodology to get it right. So instead of using a uh, one-year interval, we're going to reduce the frequency of the data and see, see how the results change. It turned out, I, I'm not sure if I have the results here. Uh, I don't have the results because uh, it's boring, but uh, uh, the table. so. But it turns out this is sort of what happens. So the coefficient on land price index, local land price index, become really larger. So that's, that's comforting because what it's saying is that uh, this is one of the major determinants of a local output cycle. What it's saying is that, uh, yes, in the short run, this local land price is contaminated, but in the long run, it captured lots and lots of information about the health of local economy, so it becomes a lot more significant. So that's good. Okay. But the main results are largely unaff uh, unaffected, though, so, so that was a good thing. This is uh, not that important, so I'm going to skip it. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a tough one. So, the, so we are trying to figure out the relationship between a business cycle in, in, in one prefecture to a business cycle in the cities. And there are so, in, so, there are so many different ways in which these two guys are related. Okay. And so you can say that there might be a lot of a model connection econometrically between these two economies. Okay. Uh, so you might say financially integrated prefecture exposed to 
common, unobservable common shock that affect the cities. And there might be linkages through trade, and that could, aff that could make the, these prefectures particularly sensitive to, to economic shocks in the cities. Okay. And that's a, that's a tough one. And we try to address it in different ways. So the first one is really a placebo test. So we'll look for evidence where it shouldn't exist, right? So what's, what, what do we do? So we look at, uh, we disaggregate the lending into a lending by city banks and lending by just local banks, okay? If, the, the, if our story is correct, then most of these shocks go through city banks, right? Not the, not the local banks, okay? And it turns out that that's exactly what's going on. So da, 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 here we go. So this is sort of interesting. So I'm going to show this. So I'm going to separate the uh, loans into those two components. It turns out that here we go. The the loans that are provided by non-city banks are particularly sensitive to a change in local land price. Okay? But the loans that are provided by city banks are not really that sensitive to local land, land price. So that actually could be a good news, right? So they, they, the city banks might be able to, uh, might be taking up the slack when local banks are not willing to provide loans. But here we go. But these results remain the same. So you, you got the, 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 the interaction of city bank share and change in land price is significant only for uh, city bank loans. So it, our results pass the placebo test. Okay. And then we also did uh, collect uh, lots and lots of data to see if, if our results survive. So the first one is distance to cities. And this is a measure that, that, that's strongly correlated with business cycle synchronization across different countries. So if you look at uh, you know, business cycles, amongst you know, 100 countries, it turns out that the synchronicity is much higher for two countries that are close to each other. So US and Canada is a good example where they go through a similar business cycle compared to the US and Japan, which is really far away from each other. Okay. And another factor that usually throw in one of those cross-country regressions is a similarity in income. So they go through a similar shock. So I'm gonna control for that and see if the results survive. Um, what we find, though, is that uh, the same result, we basically find the same results in the prefecture level data, which is that the prefectures that are closer to the city and similar to the cities in terms of income per capita respond more sensitively to economic cycles in the cities. So they go through a similar cycle. Okay. Uh, but even after we control for that, we get the same results that, that, uh, that the banking integration seems to amplify or seems to transmit uh, city shocks to local economies. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a tough one. Um, it's really wordy, and sometimes I get confused uh, by this, so I'm, I'm gonna, I try to do as good a job as possible. So this is another possibility, so, you know, each local economy in Japan are, is, is really different. You know, some economies are agriculture-based. Some economies are, you know, have a lot of manufacturing companies. You know, if you go to a city where Toyota is, that's where a lot of employments are. You know. uh, there are a lot of heterogeneity in that regard. So one possible, possible story that explains my results is that uh, the prefectures that are financially integrated may have really similar industry structure, similar to the, to the cities, okay? And that's a tough one, but one way to deal with it is to, one way to deal with this is to produce this index that captures uh, similarity in industry mix, and this is the way to, the way that, that, that we came up with, yeah, that, the way we came up with it. So first we compute the output growth of each industry in city prefectures only. So that's gonna generate A to JT, where J and T denote industry and, and year, right? So that could be uh, manufacturing, could be agriculture, could be construction, right? And they followed certain evolution over time, okay? And then, 
we compute the share of, that, of each industry using data for each non-city prefecture. So that's going to tell you what each economy looks like in terms of industry composition. Presumably, the city, uh, prefectures that are similar to the cities in terms of industry mix should be really sensitive to what's going on uh, in the cities in terms of industry shock. And that's captured by just combining these two. So the, the you, I, I multiply the share, industry share, with industry specific shock in the city. And that sort of captures the predicted output growth of prefecture given the shock that's hitting, hitting the city. Okay. The, I didn't show, I'm not going to show the results, but it, th this crazy eta variable enters positively in long growth and output growth equations. So this variable seems to capture that uh, part of the industry level shock. Okay. And still, our main results are robust. Okay. The last one that we did was uh, really this one's a lot more simple. So the so we got f 46 prefectures. We dropped six of them because they're cities. Okay. But the so the problem though is that some of those prefectures are just way too close or way too similar to cities. That uh, it could be they they could be giving us misleading results, right? Because uh, their economies should be really closely integrated with the cities in many, many different ways. And we need to drop that and see what happens. Okay. So we basically use all these prefectures that are far from cities and also different from cities in terms of income per capita. And we run the same experience with uh, industry mix as well, but the, the results are really similar because we're dropping basically the same prefecture based on different criteria. Okay. And of course, the sample size goes down by a lot by doing that, but uh, the results are pretty much the same. Though. So we are looking at yeah this variable right here. So they 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 they, they positively enter uh, the loan and, and output equation. Okay. So all right, a little bit early, but uh, that's probably enough economics. <laughs> um, all right, so just to conclude, you know, the so large financial institutions are often considered a source of strength, right? So they have really well diversified assets, so they should be robust to uh, idiosyncratic shock, so that's good. Also, these guys are able to raise large amount of money very quickly because they, are, they tend to be credit worthy. And, you know, they, they, these are the fi large financial institutions that go to the, the market where they can raise the, the, the fund at the cheapest interest rate. Okay. So that's a source of strength for the local economy. And, but our paper shows a little bit of a dark side of co banking consolidation under special circumstance, which is what if these banks manage risk properly and large shock uh, hits the balance sheet, balance sheet of these large banks, and it could potentially turn out to be really bad for, for local economies. Okay. And you know, usually I don't want to talk about policy implication, but uh, I do. Uh, again, so this kind of you know, prudential regulation I think is important, but it sort of highlights the importance of prudential regulation even more because if one country has really bad lax regulation. Of course, that's good. This, that country is going to pay for that at some point. But you know, the countries where that invites the branches and subsidiaries of these banks, they're gonna, they might have to pay for that later. So, which is part of the reason why that you know these these politicians and the financial ministers get together, you know, every month to to work out what would be the best capital regulation that we ought to apply and to harmonize regulation. So that's that's a sort of a good thing. And then the last thing is that, uh, you know, just kind of caveat. So, you know, we find the strong results. Is is this a special case? Well, it could be. So the, the, um, you probably need to take this with a little bit of grain of salt. The, the, what, what is the, what, why do I say that? Well, People actually have found that the Japanese banks are quite discriminatory. 
Okay. They they tend to favor the uh, the affiliates. In particular, firms that are closely affiliated through through the KRETS network. Okay. So part of the story might be that right that is the the, the ability of Japanese banks to supply loan supply loans were reduced in the 1990s. They were not, even though it was not profitable, they were not able to, to cut back on loans from uh, the affiliates, which are mostly located in Tokyo and, and the big cities. And instead, they cut back loans from small businesses in rural northern part of Japan. And that could be the story. So you know, th that's, that's a word of caution. Okay? Uh, but that's it. Thank you.